So to everyone who's who's just joined us, thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, sharing sharing this evening with you. Um, we're just going to wait a few more minutes for uh, a, uh, a few more guests who are going to be joining, and we'll start in about in about two minutes. Uh, sorry, Owen, I'm just going to turn off the sound that's in my space. I'll, I'll be back in one. Perfect. Can, can we send a Louis a link? Yeah, yes. He's just called to ask for a link. Perfect. We're just going to wait. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We're just going to wait one more minute uh, to allow a few more guests to arrive, and we'll begin at about five after. So are you sending the link, uh, Ern? Thank you, Carl. Um, Yes, Vicky, Vicky is sending the link now. Thank you. So I wanted to, to, to begin now um, and thank everyone uh, for, for joining us this evening. Uh, this is quite a momentous occasion for us um, as we reopen after six months of, of being closed. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome you back. My name is Owen Martin and I'm the chief curator at Noble Foundation. So it is within the context of four new exhibitions that I'm, uh, I'm speaking with you this evening. Um, each of these exhibitions, which span the historic and the contemporary, oh, yeah. demonstrate the power of art to enrich our understanding of the world. We're very proud of what we've accomplished, but more importantly, more importantly, we really want to share this with you, with our audiences. Tonight's discussion really begins that process um, and it'll be something which is ongoing. It will be succinct, offering you an introduction to these exhibitions and our program more broadly, while providing a sort of sense of what uh, you'll find at the foundation if you choose to, to visit, um, which I very much suggest you do. This discussion, as I've sort of hinted at, is also a catalyst for a series of ongoing virtual engagements over Instagram and Zoom with artists, curators, um, scholars from a range of different uh, disciplines that offer a sort of deep dive into each artist's practice, as well as the ideas which really connect uh, these artists, because I think there's just as many uh, points of connection and similarity as there are differences. So if you do have a particular interest in an artist or theme, I'd encourage you to keep an eye on our Instagram and Facebook pages and, and join us virtually over, over the months of September, October, and then into November. Earlier today, my colleague Carl Nell said that Jackson Kluwane's three-dimensional works, of whom we've just opened a retrospective of, is philosophy made material, and I'm paraphrasing here. And as I prepared for this discussion, I couldn't wow. think of a better way to really capture how the objects and images that are currently on view at the foundation make manifest the ideas, the values, um, as well as the understanding that the artists who created them hold dear. So as a way to reflect on these things, a curator responsible for each exhibition will take you through the relevant exhibition. Um, and so we're going to begin with, uh, well, with our atrium. So it's the first work you would experience as you walk into Noble Foundation. 
Um, and in the atrium, we have a major commission uh, entitled Inyanga Zonyaka by Ati Paturuga, which will be on view until July 26, 2021. And it's affixed, to the, it's affixed to the windows overlooking the sculpture garden. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, my colleague and adjunct curator, Kanisile Mbongwa, and she will speak a bit about this exhibition. Thank you, thank you, Kanisile, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Owen. Chokozan. Tos tos ngan so mi. Unga bali sama bali ube ni uzo puma impondo. Ati patra hugaz inyanga zo nyaka, the Luna Songbook, is set out in Azania, a land of sacred revolution, a land where God listens. In this first iteration, Huga Story World takes the form of a vinyl window, permeating the space. What happened? Oh. In the first iteration, Huga Story World takes the form of a window vinyl, permeating the space like the mouth of the universe, opening out to the atrium. Inspired by the stained glass of a church, the translucent film depicts a visual narrative which cross-pollinates through various time zones. What has always drawn me to Huga's practice is their avatars and alternate realities they create as a means to view how traumas of colonial histories position the contemporary lived experiences of Black, queer, and femme peoples. The non-linear procession of time in Huga's work that one witnesses through their avatars and narratives that are constructed as a lens to process the past, to critique the present, and to propose humanist visions of the future. Here, we are introduced to Huga's avatars as threads to a narrative, a soap opera of sorts, an interplay between the mythical, fictional, and the real blur lines to summon a cosmic restoration. The meticulous detail capturing the celestial relationship between the nature and the time showcases the divine intervention of the everyday. Very high stuff. Here we witness Unomali Zokwezi in a politics of transcending. She is a thoroughfare of worlds connecting and colliding in her. Uli Kaba Eli Koboka. She ascends in a dance with herself like Jesus on Ascension Day. Suspended mid-air, Nomalizo is negotiating two traditional archetypes, being a poise figure or umakoti. In this instance, we witness her losing herself to social, sotile expectations, spiritual expectations, and God's expectations. Seeing Isitaba Sake, her church hat, falling into the ground, is Huga communicating Umama Webaiki being in conflict as much as we witness Umma Kodi's conflict in the way her bum is exposed. And if we carefully look, we see that there isn't much interaction between her and her son Umaibuye. Her long, his longing gaze towards her mother on his left, but also he gazes towards Abakweta, the initiates. The procession speaks of the movement, Kamaibuye as Umkweta, going into the water with Idwaha, which is the month of September, October, through the concealed initiate. So for me, what's fascinating here is if we look from this particular initiate, Maibuye is a merman, which means he has undergone a form of Indwaso and is now what Huga named Umamlambo Wasegrinika. Maibuye is at a crossroad, the birth of trauma and the birth of the decolonial. Wearing a uniform from Caprivi, on his beret, one notices there's an Azanian Freedom Army emblem with an elo. And I think Huga did a very clever thing here because he traces the land in such a small detail. You have to look very carefully to be able to see that, that emblem. So while Nomalizo is transcending, um, while Nomalizo is transcending is a suspended ascension that captures her double consciousness and the inner tension within the embattled heroine. Maibuya's transcending is an underwater cleansing that transforms him into a merman. There are many more, uh, many more symbolisms that I can discuss here. The Star of Bethlehem that is also Ikwezi, which is Isilimela, 
the initiates and the way they gaze, the phallic canes zabakweta, the intertwined aloe, the wilting pumpkin vines, the Lovedale Tower that represents intellect and imagination, that Huga unearths as etchings of a reckoning, an awakening, and a veneration of the ancestral. Huga is deliberate and intentional in how they weave their imagination with historical archives, folklore, and the everyday. They leave nothing to chance here, being critically sensitive to how their story worlds carve out space in our perceived national memory and in the art canon. Every time I gaze at this tableau, I don't know actually what I'm feeling. I can't quite access the words to articulate what is happening to me. In fact, I feel like words fail me. Inyanga Zonyaga, the Luna songbook, is a pilgrimage. Togoza, back to you, Owen. Thank you, Kanisile. Um, thank you for walking us through the, the narrative and the ideas behind uh, Atipaturuga's work. So from, a, from the atrium, as you pass through the foundation, you'll move into, um, into gallery one. And, and in this space, we have uh, an exhibition uh, entitled, And Then You See Yourself, uh, of the work of Zanelle Mahole. And to, in order to take us through that work, which um, was co-curated by myself and my colleague, Kanya Mashabella, who's the assistant curator at the foundation, um, Kanya will, will speak to us about that exhibition. Um, and it's something I'm quite excited about because it, it looks at uh, Mahole's most recent work through the lens of um, some of the earliest pieces that, uh, that they're, they're known for. So with that, Kanya, I'll, uh, I'll pass over to you and let you uh, take, o take over the conversation. Thank you, Owen. Um, I want to first excuse the sound. Um, in order to be in the space and to create that ambiance, we also have the video work playing in the background. Hopefully it's not too loud for everyone. Um, so, um, and then you see yourself um, is basically our way of trying to access kind of the, the roots of um, Zanina Moholi's practice and the central focus. And um, in Owen and I's discussions, the things that we saw most intensely was how um, Moholi plays with the gaze and the sensation of viewing others and being viewed um, and what that feels like on both sides of the, of the frame and on both sides of the lens for the photographer. So um, we broke the exhibition up into uh, multiple groups um, and we can call it three groups, but there's kind of subsections in a way. Um, first, we have the, um, the, the video, I, Me, which was created in 2012. Um, it's one of the earlier works in the, in the exhibition. And you are confronted by a wall of eyes. Um, and this, this wall of eyes basically um, kind of sets the tone for seeing and being seen and the kind of self-consciousness self that happens um, in this experience. Um, and then we have the alcove, um, which is filled with um, what we call black mandalas. But um, these, these are basically made, they're digital collages of menstrual blood stains that um, Moholi made um, quite early in their career as well. Um, and each one is named after an incident of either gender-based violence or violence against um, queer black people in South Africa. Um, so while it's about them inhabiting their own body, it's also about, um, it's also about violence in the country and how it affects um, identity construction and, uh, and, um, and, and, and queerness, essentially. Um, and so inside of, that, um, inside of that alcove, which creates this very spiritual feeling um, environment, and along with the sound that you're hearing now, that's coming from the video. We have the video, um, Lona Mzimbawami, which is Here Lies My Body. And we get a very intense, um, detailed, um, close panning shot of the artist's body. Um, again, a kind of a sign of inhabiting um, the body and what that feels like um, in relation to being looked at. Um, kind of mirrored with violence as they drag a knife around their, their naked body. Um, we also have the salon hang that comes directly after that. And this is our meditation, ultimately, this first half of the exhibition 
of intimate private spaces um, because uh, we broke up the exhibition into the artist as a mediator of their own private space and their own private self in their personal relationships and then the public relationship and how they engage with public narratives about what it means to be black or to be femme or to be queer. Um, so in the second, the second half of the exhibition, that kind of, there's a kind of transition that happens. Um, the first half is them in their kind of intimate relationships with, with um, romantic partners and with themselves. And these works feel more candid and almost like snapshots. And they're not traditionally what we would call a well-composed photograph, but they're more experimental and more spontaneous. And then as we kind of travel across the, um, along the wall, um, we get into this public kind of, um, this kind of public interaction. Um, one of the first is the Miss Lesbian series. And in the series, um, the artist is, um, presents themselves as a beauty queen. Um, and it's partly about them owning their, their queer um, identity but also engaging with the expectations of what it means to be femme or to be masculine and playing with the boundaries of why we see um, gender as being binary. Um, and this is kind of um, one of the earlier kind of themes that we feel, but um, it kind of culminates into um, Somnyama Ngonyama. And that is the, the, the series that Moholi is obviously most known for, but also where we see their interaction with the gays most realized. Um, you can kind of see some of the images behind me. Um, but these works, um, rather than being kind of these kind of snapshots, borrow more from fashion photography and ethnography. And we took these associations and created these coupled groups of artworks that we felt created a more clear narrative. Um, and because these works happened over a long span of time, um, they weren't necessarily created with each other in mind, but they fit so perfectly. Um, it's almost a puzzle piece that creates a story um, of their kind of engagement with um, their own image and also um, the viewer's gaze. And it kind of creates a self-consciousness within the viewer. Um, and that's also why I liked the title, And Then You See Yourself, because by looking at Moholi, you are forced to confront yourself and the ways in which you construct your identity and the ways that you perceive your gender or your race or your identity as being stable. And we hope that it will, in some ways, destabilize these um, previously stable um, forms of identity. Fantastic. Thank you, Kanya. Um, it was a real pleasure to work on that exhibition uh, together and to realize um, and have the chance to work with with Maholi's practice, um, because it is this this remarkable body of work. Um, so as we as we move from Gallery One uh, back across the atrium and into into Galleries Two through Eight, so that is the the larger spaces where you may have seen uh, William Kentridge's exhibition, uh, Why Should I Hesitate Sculpture. So in those in the, in the place of of, of that exhibition. Is, uh, is a retrospective of, of Jackson Klawane. And I'm going to just momentarily pass uh, the, the baton, if you will, over to, to Carl Nell and Nessa Liebhammer. Carl Nell is our senior advising curator. Nessa Liebhammer is an, is an adjunct curator on this project, on this exhibition. Um, but I'd just like to point out some of the uh, points of connection between these, these exhibitions. Um, there is a sort of sense of the spiritual um, in, a, in a way which is perhaps surprising uh, in, in artists who we perhaps think of uh, more in relationship to uh, social practice or artists who are um, more better, better known for their activism. Um, Maholi calls himself a, um, a visual activist, uh, for example. But what, what comes to the forefront and what, what are the things that has really struck me over um, over the last few months, and especially now, um, as we've um, included or as we've um, installed these these four exhibitions, is the degree to which this this sort of spirituality is really a balm for our current moment. It is a way of perhaps um, finding uh, connection and meaning in uh, in a world which is very challenging, uh, most certainly for for most people. Um, 
So with that, I will we'll pass it over to, to Carl and Nessa to, to discuss um, the fantastic, uh, fantastic exhibition of Jackson Kilmarnock. Carl and Nessa. Thank you. Thank you, Owen, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to begin first, and then Carl will pick up uh, after my introduction. As uh, Owen has mentioned, this is a retrospective exhibition of Jackson Kilwani. The title of the exhibition is Alton Amiga, which is the beginning and the end. Um, Jackson Kilwani is possibly the, the most important sculptor to emerge in South Africa in the 1980s. And his work is a remarkable integration of, of thought systems and beliefs of Old and New Testament, his Tonga Shangan heritage, and globally sourced in, in influences. And what has been particularly interesting in the research leading up to this exhibition is the uncovering of, partic of particularly possible connections with an ancient Ethiopian Christian church uh, that dates back to 400 AD, which is, an, and, the, and perhaps the conceptualization of a truly African-based Christianity. And there are also uh, links and indications that he um, um, perhaps not followed, but had uh, uh, links to the Rastafari movement, um, making for a really rich, um, uh, theoretical background for this exquisitely beautiful show. I mean, his objects are quite transcendent um, uh, and hopefully you will all come and see it. Jackson was born in um, around 1923. We are not totally sure of his date. And again, he was born, he was in a rural area and we again are not 100% sure. We think he was born in Venda, what was then Venda and was relocated during the apartheid era to what was then Gazankulu, which was seen as the homeland for so-called Songa and Shangan speaking people. Um, these areas are now integrated and uh, both lie in Limpopo province. He was taught carving by his father in the way that most uh, skills in, in Africa are, um, are, are handed down in, in, you know, when they were before Western colonization. Um, he didn't go to school. As far as we know, he wasn't literate, um, but he had an incredible um, uh, grasp of the Bible and was able to quote, um, you know, just verbatim. Um, he was taught, um, he was ordained as a lay preacher. So he's a, he's a Christian man. He's ordained as a lay preacher in the African Zionist church, but uh, in the 1940s, he and his wife. And he, see, he was dissatisfied with the theology and the practice of the Zionist church. We're not 100% sure why uh, we've not uncovered that, but there was certainly a satisfaction. And he, was, he said he was waiting for the uh, a sign of a true religion. And in... In the late 1970s, about 1978, he, he had suffered for a long time from a, a very painful wound in his leg, which wouldn't heal. And he was about to commit suicide. And he said before he could commit suicide, he um, experienced an epiphany. And in this epiphany, um, uh, Christ appeared to him with two followers and they prevented him from uh, taking his own life they um, said that he would see God, he would uh, be healed, and that he would devote his life to preaching which is in, and healing, which is in fact what he did. He had found a hilltop site near where he lived at Mbokoto village in uh, what is Limpopo. Um, and on this hilltop site were the remains of an old Iron Age site of uh, autochthonous people who had lived there, um, you know, probably in the 1500s. And on top of this uh, indigenous African settlement, he created a palimpsest in which he um, overlaid his own vision for the site, which was a New Jerusalem, a place uh, where he could preach and heal, place of the new country. Um, he restructured and he rebuilt and he created a pilgrimage site. It was a hill, so you began at the bottom of the hill and you 
moved through numerous stations along the hill, which all had um, religious allegorical meanings. The most important two sites on the hill were his altar to God and his altar to Christ. Uh, and there you see in the images his altar to Christ, and that's where he would preach and heal. And behind the altar to Christ was the Rebola mountain, which is magical and sacred in the area. So um, we have, for the first time in this exhibition, brought together the two, the two altars, which were um, taken from the site. They were acquired by Witz Art Museum and the Johannesburg Art Gallery. And they were acquired because he, he wished them to continue to proselytize in the city. He wanted his word to get out, not just to be limited to the rural area, but to move into the city and to, um, you know, spread the word of God and of his new country, of his um, peace and harmony between racial groups. Um, so a very, um, um, a very uh, meaningful message that he preached and very politically meaningful in the time that he lived. Um, so I think that I'm going to stop there. We have uh, just, uh, I'm going to hand it on to Carl, who will take it into other details of the exhibition. Thank you. Um, if you go over to you, Carl. There we go. Uh, thank you, Nessa. Um, it's, uh, Nessa has, has sketched the background of uh, where, Long, uh, where Jackson's Long Wine uh, created his New Jerusalem. I'm sad that uh, you haven't seen any of the sculptures. Uh, you just saw the archeological, well, what looks like an archeological site. But uh, there are remarkable, huge sculptures on the exhibition, some which are four meters high to, uh, to sculptures which are literally about that size. So this extreme. Behind me is the, uh, the first room that we come into on, on the exhibition. And this is where we look at the antecedents of Longwani's work. Behind me is a small headrest with a foot uh, carved by an early Tsonga Shangan carver. And uh, we see similar um, iconography emerging in Longwani's work where he will carve, for instance, um, God's foot with eggs, or uh, there are sticks in this room which have a hand holding an egg, and we will see that uh, that theme move through his sculptures right up to the four meter Adam and Eve. And uh, these uh, headrests were linked to the ancestral world and uh, in the in the dream state, as it were. And Longwani's work is uh, focused on this relationship between his uh, daily experience, the ancestral world, and the biblical world. And he carves, he, he carves a headrest. I'm just going to um, take you over here um, so that you can see it. This is a Songwani headrest, and uh, on it is a small book, and the book is the Bible. So um, his uh, ancestral link in this headrest becomes a symbolic object, which takes us really into the numinous uh, realm. Long, Longwani, um, I'm going to just reel you through, the, uh, through this room, which has a, another Longwani headrest. And uh, we'll see some of the, the pa his panels. And uh, his, uh, we pass his little parliament here. And uh, I'm going to take you into the room that I particularly wanted to share, which is uh, the, the early crucifixes, which have never been seen uh, together um, before. Uh, there are, we found four early crucifixes, which were done in the 1960s. Longwani's uh, major output uh, and the Acropolis site emerged uh, in the 1980s. And uh, these four early crucifixes uh, were, were done in the 60s and they have allusions to 
very early Christian art, almost 10th century uh, German crucifixes. And they are, uh, they are really uh, very, uh, they're very traditional in their form and that they, they really do, uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, they do, um, they do have these very archaic uh, feels to them. This crucifix, for instance, there are photographs of it nailed to a, a tree at Mbukoto. And uh, so it, it has this, uh, this very early Christian feel to it. And the, the crucifixes, uh, the, the first three crucifixes are, are, very, um, are very traditional with their hands outstretched and pinned to the cross. By the time he gets to his final crucifix, um, uh, which you can just see behind me here, um, is a crucifix where he, he uh, actually makes uh, the image of himself on, on, the, on, the, on the cross. And the crucifix starts to be transformed. And uh, we feel that he becomes really embodied within the subject matter uh, of, of his art. So from this point onwards, he, um, his, his imagery is, um, is transformed to images of God, uh, Christ, and Gabriel, who are not abstract figures for him, but are figures who uh, exist on the hill at Umbukoto. So he, uh, he lives amongst these uh, divine presences and he carves them. And these are the objects which you will see on the altars here. And they look very different to Western conceptions uh, of these figures who we know within the kind of Western uh, biblical tradition. And of course, he is carving up in the northern province in amongst a very richly treed area. And uh, he, in the end, I think he is an animist. We, we feel this very strong connection between him and the natural world, between him and the wood itself, and the subjects that he carves. It is a, it is a very powerful exhibition to experience. It uh, is an exhibition that has taken enormous effort to put in place. And uh, I think it is a, uh, an exhibition which should not be missed because I don't think uh, the, uh, an exhibition like this will be able to be, um, take, take place again uh, because of the huge logistics behind it. So come and see it. I think earn. Hand over. Thank you, Carl. Um, uh, thank you for and Nessa for for taking us through uh, the, that remarkable exhibition. So, as you pass from the galleries downstairs, uh, the large uh, that large space of Gallery Eight, and move uh, upstairs to the the gallery at the at the very end of the foundation, um, you'll come into. Uh, an exhibition entitled Recent Acquisitions by the Homestead Collection. And this exhibition, which was put together by uh, myself, uh, Kanya Mashabella and Carl Nell, um, looks at the, the recent acquisitions of, of the Homestead Collection, like its name suggests. Um, and it really charts the sort of evolving identity of this collection. Um, and this is, a, this is really our major resource at the foundation. The artworks included uh, are from the 20th and 21st century uh, and span the, the, the entire continent of Africa. Uh, the, broad, the, the exhibition is really uh, broadly made up of four uh, groupings. So there's four groups, but these sort of ideas um, and the, the points of connection uh, ricochet, as my, as my colleague Carl uh, said uh, a few nights ago, and I just loved that word ricochet they so there 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 is these these four groupings but then there are meanings and uh, that that move beyond them um so i'm going to take you through the first group and then um i'll pass off to to carl and to kanya 
so this oh, um, first sorry, yep. um, just to interrupt you I, I i do have the images for you so let me um help Perfect. you I'll, I'll share the screen sorry i'm just great thank you kanya uh so i'll begin as as kanya prepares those those images for you and the the first the the first few works i'd like to speak about um really use the animal as a means to reflect on human fear, but also its transcendence. Um, so in Georgina Gratrix's Guard Dog, which will come up on the screen now, um, the humor of this sort of fearsome pup, uh, as we called it, belies a sort of a darker existential threat, or, or perhaps that humor is also an antidote to this sort of existential angst that one can, that is palpable in the, in, in the image. Um, similarly, the gorilla and poodles in Kate Gotkin's Harvey, Kate Gotkin's Harvey are, really, are really sort of absurd in contrast to the, the decaying opulence in which the exhibition, um, or in which the, the painting depicts these, these animals. Um, but it becomes that, heart, that work Harvey becomes more poignant when one recalls that, uh, that the year this work was created, 2017, um, was also the year in which um, the serial abuse of women by the disgraced media mogul uh, Harvey Weinstein came to light. So it develops a sort of uh, more serious undertone when you, uh, when you, when you become aware of that. Um, and the gestural mark making uh, of Gratrix and Gotkins really finds its contrast uh, in the precision uh, of Alexis Prowler's uh, Sweet Bird of Youth. So in this image, uh, in this image, a single egret uh, appears, and um, it's a it's a it's a bird that has appeared throughout Preller's uh, oeuvre. And as it gazes out toward this immense depth and the sort of indeterminacy of the light, which is beyond that depth, um, you you get a sense that this is um, this is about Preller's own mortality. It's really you know as this is the last painting that the artist completed. I think it really can be read, read as a meditation on mortality um, and, and a beautiful one at that. Uh, it's, it's poignant and it's, it's, it's poetic in its sort of quiet resolve. So with that, I will pass, um, pass you over to uh, Carl, who will take us through the work of... I'm sorry, I just, um, I've just sent the, the uh, presentation. I'm having te technical difficulties on my side. <laughs> it's not yeah. wanting to play the... Not a problem. Thank you, Kanye. We'll we'll get that going for you now. Um, not a problem. So, Carl, I'll pass on to you. Maybe you can begin as we as we load the uh, the the next PowerPoint on. Well, uh, I think uh, what what is what is interesting is uh, in this uh, exhibition of of new of uh, newly acquired pieces is that uh, it. It does show a, a shift in the collecting uh, policy, um, or not policy, I suppose, really, in uh, Louis Norville and Marley Foster's uh, acquiring. Many of the works have been acquired in London uh, and uh, in New York. And they, as Owen says, they do cover a, a wide range uh, of, um, of artists working in Africa and in South Africa. Uh, in particular. Uh, it uh, doesn't seem much sense uh, talking about works that you can't see. So um, I think uh, if, we, uh, if, if we do look at uh, the works that, that are in the collection, they, they relate um, to, to uh, the work of Sherry Samba, who uh, is uh, an artist who works out of Kinshasa, Oh, here we go. Thank heavens. <laughs> um, so uh, if we go to, um, I don't know if you wanted to, there we go. There's the Alexis, there's a, the, the Georgina Gatrix, the, the, the little hound dog. Uh, there's uh, uh, Kate Gotten's Harvey um, with uh, the poodles and the gorilla that uh, Owen spoke about. And um, then we come to Eddie, uh, Kamalunga uh, Elunga Sue, who is um, 
is also from the from the Congo, and um, we see his. Uh, it's it's called uh, conscience, uh, um, sort of fragile conscience, and we see these uh, figures which are encoded with uh, digital circuitry, uh, a kind of a language in its own right which uh, underpins the uh, technologies of our time. But these figures are also uh, dressed in a language of cloth which is so powerful in Africa. And um, uh, Eddie uh, paints these with enormous care. They look almost photographic but they are meticulously painted. Uh, the figures, uh, sorry, could you go back to the previous image? Yes. The, uh, the figures are meticulously painted and uh, we see how there's a Toby jug uh, which uh, creates the focal point of a set of, all, of three paintings that are on the exhibition. And the Toby jug seems to be a kind of symbol of, uh, of, of colonial, um, a kind of colonial relic and uh, there's a kind of intrigue uh, with quite a number of the figures in relation to this particular object. So the, the, the paintings are, uh, are, are a kind of narrative that plays between three which dominate the, the gallery space. If we could then go to the Sherry Samba and uh, a work of his uh, called the uh, College of Wisdom, and uh, it relates to urban signage. Uh, some of the most interesting uh, um, African painting for me uh, emerged from the uh, barber board um, paintings uh, that uh, appeared through West Africa, really showing clients what the best hairstyles were. And we see how Sherry Samba picks up on this, and uh, that he seems to be using a series of different uh, registers of language uh, in the painting where one has the almost Islamic script in the background. One has these three heads, which are racially um, distinct, an African, an a, a, a European and an Asian head that seem to be almost um, peeled off their core and the figure right in the, the, in the background uh, balances the globe uh, on, on his tongue. And of course, Africa and South America are at the center of this globe, not, not Europe. So uh, there's a, a cartoonesque quality and a, and a power uh, in the work uh, that is, is part of a movement that we see coming out of Congo, Kinshasa. Own, should we hand over to you or? Um, I think it's uh, my turn now. <laughs> okay. Now I'll pass on to Kanya and continue the screen sharing of the, of the other works. Yes. Um, yes, so um, continuing the exhibition, um, as Owen said, uh, the word that we, we thought of as we were doing this exhibition was Carl's word, which was ricochet. Um, and in many ways they are kind of similarities and overlaps and then differences. Um, and so on the next wall, as we move over from um, Sherry Samba and Eddie Kamuanga um, Ilunga, we see Klinga Samson. Um, Klinga is a Cape Townian artist um, and he, he creates these beautiful, often self-portraits, but usually um, portraits in general, um, oil on canvas. And um, in this particular image, I was really drawn to it, particularly because it um, also kind of relates to what's happening downstairs in Atipatra Ruha's um, exhibition. And there is basically this um, tension between the earthly and um, the spiritual. Um, but this is also kind of connected to um, Klinger's own um, understanding of his own masculinity and how it kind of relates to to kind of um, financial uh, stability and economic freedom. Um, and that kind of idea is obviously very important in the South African context where um, poverty has kind of been used to emasculate um, a lot of black South African men. And that's kind of signified by this gold chain. 
um, some of the, um, um, of um, Klinger's other self-portraits um, take this idea to greater heights where he's wearing brand, branded clothing um, and um, other kind of signifiers of class and wealth. Um, but in kind of opposition to this is this kind of dark cast that you see on this, on this self-portrait and also these glowing blank eyes, which kind of um, hint towards the spiritual realm that um, kind of transcends kind of like worrying about these earthly goods. Um, on the next slide, we'll also see um, Pierre Fouché. Um, and this image is uh, very different to um, the one before it, um, although it is also in some ways a representation of uh, Pierre, Pierre's own um, kind of mediation of masculinity. And in this image, you see two men wading in the ocean, in the water. And there's kind of a subtle hint towards a kind of subdued, um, kind of um, same-sex intimacy. And to think about that intimacy as male bonding in a, in a way that's kind of suggestive. Um, but belying all of this partly is this kind of um, post-impressionist like language of um, kind of this, um, this kind of um, pontillistic kind of visual language, um, which when you look closely at the work, um, it's, it's also assemblage. Um, a number of um, dice um, brought together to create this image. And this also ricochets, as we've been saying, to this kind of schematic language that's in um, Edi Kamunga's Ilunga's work, um, as well as the, uh, the later um, parts of the exhibition. For example, we also see Herod Marx in this work, um, whose picture I'm going to apologize for because I think that the image isn't as nice as we would like it but um, taking maps together and kind of using this assemblage to create something that is um, as a whole greater than its parts. And, and I'll pass on to Carl, I believe. <laughs> um, well, it, it is a pity, um, this image of Herod Marx's, because you can't see it. It's, uh, it is extremely precise, made of uh, details from maps. And it has a real sense of authority in the way that it is drawn. It does create a, 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 an unsettling um, uh, ambiguity uh, within, the, within the work. Uh, he literally is drawing with the map. So there is a, uh, there's a found nature to the, uh, the quality of the line. And uh, that this builds up to create uh, the uh, kind of flutter within the, the collage. And uh, that it, uh, it is, um, I suppose, what I would call a, a mental abstraction. It uh, deals with uh, perspective and anti-perspective. And uh, it um, creates uh, the, this unsettling ambiguity um, even although it feels as though it is a very authoritative work. If we move from, uh, from Herod Marx to Elias Sime's piece, uh, a piece which was acquired in New York, and uh, it, is, uh, it is really uh, also fascinating in the sense that it is made from found material. It is a reclaimed uh, electronic uh, circuitry boards, and... Um, when one looks closely at the piece, the the, um, the, the there are very small dots and circuits uh, that move across it, and one feels that it is really part of a very abstract mental uh, terrain uh, shared very much uh, with ferret marks, like we've just spoken about, but. The surface in this case has a kind of metallic uh, and a plastic uh, quality to it as well. The, the piece is made up of, of small panels which are hung side by side. And uh, the two uh, brown forms look as though they could be three-dimensional uh, um, objects standing with a slight shadow, or at other times they feel almost like doors in this um, this highly articulated or kind of shimmering space. Next slide. Ern, would you like to speak about Ernest Moncova? 
Thank you, Carl. Um, I think the I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, so what's what was very interesting in in Mankoba's work, as well as your own, Carl, which is included in this exhibition, um, is this tension between the sort of architectural um, and uh, the gestural, or uh, we've sort of we as we've written the autographic mark. Um, but I think both Mankoba's work, uh, your your own work, Carl, um, which I'll pull up on the screen here, um, speak to and try to represent something of the ineffable. The again, we keep using this word, the spiritual, um, and create a new. Certainly, in the case of Mankoba, I'll go back. Create a sort of or attempted to create a whole, a sort of new language. Um, a new sort of gestalt um, that is uh, aesthetically and conceptually motivated, um, and and this sort of tension for me is is, is quite is quite interesting and, and quite remarkable, and it, it runs through as we've mentioned a number of works in this in this exhibition. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, thank everyone for for joining, and. I will thank everyone for joining, um, but I must thank uh, our remarkable, the remarkable team who have put this together. I'm not gonna go through the list of everyone involved, but really the, not only the curatorial team, but the, um, our communications coordinator um, and uh, the uh, public program coordinator, uh, Vicky Lecone, um, and the, 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 larger, the larger museum team, everyone from the front desk manager Sam um, to Lindsay Hendricks, our education coordinator. Um, I think a special, uh, a special thanks also goes out to all of our patrons and especially the Noble family who, who really make this all possible. They, um, they, their, their generosity allows us to undertake the programming that we do and is, uh, is a remarkable gift not only to, to, the, to the team and to the city but to, to the country as well. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to allow uh, Vicky to say a few few closing remarks, and uh, that'll be it for me. So thank you for joining this evening. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to everyone who took um, some time out of their evening to join us. It's it's an absolute pity to not have been able to do this um, in person. Um, but I, I have to say, even just from today, it's been incredible. It's just been such amazing energy to have people actually inside the museum. Um, it was starting to feel a little bit spooky, <laughs> um, but but it was it was really great to have people around, and we're we're looking forward to having all of you at some point um, walking through and, and getting to experience these exhibitions. Um, this weekend we actually have um, four scheduled um, very special um, walkabouts that will be led by um, Carl Nell and Amos Litzwalo, who um, alongside Nessa Liebhammer co-curated Jackson Flungwani's um, Alton Omega. Um, so if you just head on over to our website, you'll be able to book for those. It's very important to book um, only 10 slots um, per session, unfortunately. And we also have a, a very kind of rigorous, so to speak, program following that. So if you join us every Wednesday evening um, from next week, we'll be giving you um, a bit more in-depth um, focus into each of the exhibitions. I know today was kind of a, a snapshot, so to speak. So um, in, in over the next few weeks, we'll be able to dive a little bit deeper um, and, and really explore um, the exhibitions, the works, and of course, all of the history behind all of them. So yeah, we're looking forward to having all of you and uh, hope you all have a good night. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs>